It's my pleasure now to be joined by John Heyman to talk a little bit about what's going on in New York and around the rest of Major League Baseball. Hey, John, thanks for spending a couple minutes with me. Hi, Carolyn. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Let's start with the Mets. Uh, I think a lot of fans are hitting the panic button, especially when they look to the payroll to start the season. And now they're in this slump where June has been especially unkind. What do you think is ultimately ailing them? Well, it really is shocking. A $377 million payroll is a record. Everyone was expecting a great season here in New York. They were the number one ranked rotation in baseball coming in on MLB.com. Now, I I didn't do a rankings, but I certainly would have had them in the top five. And uh, they've been in the bottom five in terms of their starting pitching. Everybody has taken a step backwards, starting at the top with Verlander and Scherzer, the two highest paid guys in baseball, $43.33 million. Neither one of them has been great. They've both missed a little bit of time. The middle rotation hasn't been that much better. Obviously, Quintana has been out. Carrasco has not been very good. Seng has been the one guy who's done about what you'd expect. Everyone else way below. David Peterson and Tyler McGill both sent down now, and neither one of them performed. So, really, I think it's the starting pitching for the most part, but uh, – Nobody, nobody has outperformed with the possible exception of David Robertson, who's done a great job closing. But certainly uh, Lindor, McNeil, Marte, guys who were great last year. I've just been about average this year as well. But generally, I think we, we kind of know it's the pitching right now. Were there any warning signs that their aces were not going to be ready to perform? Well, I mean, I talked to Verlander recently, and he said he did not feel great in spring training. And then, of course, he missed the first month. So I guess that's a bit of a warning sign. Uh, the only other warning sign is that one's 40, that being Verlander, the other 38. And really, age has been a huge factor this year in performance. I don't know if that's because of the clock or, I mean, obviously, it's always been a factor. But look, Verlander was led the American League last year with a 175 ERA. Scherzer was very good other than his last couple starts with the Mets. I mean, they just obviously did not see this. They wouldn't have signed Verlander for $86 million. So no great warning signs. I wouldn't say they were great in spring training, particularly Verlander, but uh, nobody saw this coming. It's interesting you mentioned the pitching clock. I want to get your impressions on that overall. I mean, just as a fan, as a casual fan, I've really enjoyed how fast the game has moved, to be honest. Um, You know, no more nights sitting in the press box for hours and hours and hours. It seems to have picked things up a little bit, but that's that's an interesting connection you make, that with some of the veteran guys, it might be uh, unwelcomed and potentially detrimental. What are your impressions of of how fast the game is moving overall, and and is that a, a legitimate connective tissue that some of these older aces might, might be having some problems? Yeah, I, I do think it is an issue. I talked to Max Scherzer about this earlier in the year, and he did see that as an issue, and I wonder if it's going to be even more of an issue as we get into the warmer months. And these guys who are in their late 30s or even 40 have to pitch at this pace. I mean, you know, going in, you wouldn't have thought so. Obviously, they tested it in the minor leagues, but nobody in the minor leagues is 38 or 40, or at least at least I hope not. And, uh, you know, they didn't foresee this at all as an issue, but it does seem to be an issue. It's, it has been great for the game. I think the fans, 90% of them like it, I think. Um Certainly the writers like it. It's great for the deadlines. We're now able to write better stories. I hope. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but uh, getting that extra 28 minutes or so is a big plus. Uh, I hope my verbs and nouns are better. I don't know. Uh, it's it's better. There's really uh, no reason not to have done this, and it's been a very, very big plus. I think all the rules have been very positive in baseball this year. Yeah. Is there anything else that's really stuck out to you in terms of adjustments that were made with the rules that you think has had a great impact? Well, the thing that I thought would have the greatest impact was the banning of the shift. And if it's had an impact, it's not as noticeable. Uh, Perhaps it's been a little bit better for big lefties like Rizzo, Gallo. Maybe they're doing a little bit better because of it. But, uh, you know, in the end, we may notice a difference. But game to game, The other big difference has been the stolen bases. You know, I mean, there are guys who are like Anthony Volpe, who's just new in the league and used to the pitch clock because he was in the minors last year and used to the bigger bases. He's 15 for 15, and he's not alone. I I mean, the base stealing percentage is 80% plus now. So uh, I think that's good for the game. I think people like to see stolen bases. Uh, So I think the bigger bases, the – 
limit on the disengagements by the pitchers. They've it's all been positive for more stolen bases. So I think the rules have been great. Uh, if they can figure out a way to get fewer strikeouts and more balls in play, I guess those are connected. Uh, that would be the next plus. And uh, it still is not really happening to the degree that they'd hoped. Um, the pitchers are just too good. They throw too hard. The breaking balls are too sharp. And, uh, you know, I mean, that is an issue in baseball. I, I hope it doesn't mean they're going to move the mound back by a foot or two. They thought about it and didn't do that. Um, I can't imagine that would be good for the pitchers. I know Pedro Martinez is very much against that, and I'm sure a lot of the other pitchers are as well. But uh, there are a lot of strikeouts. And I think that's why they haven't gone to the tackier ball and why we have that issue now with the ball. Uh, if the ball was tackier and be better for the pitchers, we'd probably see even more strikeouts. I do want to ask you about Volpe, who you mentioned. But, you know, I, I feel like you're kind of touching on a, a macro story here, which is that the adjustments that have been made to the game – are almost making it more of a young man's game than maybe we've seen in the past. I mean, not just on the mound with these pitches coming faster and faster, but some of the other adjustments that you're highlighting and the guys who have been in the minors who might have a little bit of an advantage in terms of experience with some of these changes. I mean, is that ultimately sort of where we're tracking that, you know, you have to be a little bit more fit. Maybe you have to be a little bit younger to take advantage of the new system that's in place. Yeah, I think that's very possible. I think that's why we have a lot of surprises in baseball right now. Teams that were expected to be really, really good uh, are not necessarily so great right now. I mean, that includes uh, the Padres, who've shown a little bit of signs of improvement lately, but still not what you'd expect. Uh, the Phillies, same thing, a little bit of sh signs of improvement, but still not what you'd expect. Certainly St. Louis, uh, the White Sox, the Yankees to a degree, certainly the Mets. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got younger teams that are doing very well, better than expected. The Orioles are a very young team, and they look terrific. Uh, Tampa Bay is a team where just about everybody's in the prime of their career. That's probably the goal of everybody, but they don't have very many old players, and they're doing uh, spectacularly well. And obviously, there's some other good surprise teams. Arizona has been a nice surprise. Cincinnati, and these are not old teams, so... Uh, you know, this is one thing uh, that was probably in the equation with this pitch clock that uh, I don't, I'm not sure teams considered, but uh, the teams that are younger seem to have benefited. I, I don't know how many Mets fans placed a preseason wager for the team to win the World Series with the payroll as high as it is. But uh, I wish maybe they wish that they would have been thinking about that ahead of time because it certainly affected them. Just lastly on the Mets, I mean. If that is, if this theory is is true that that this is something that's going to continue to plague the starting rotation and it's only going to maybe intensify as the months get warmer, do you see them turning a corner at any point? I mean, they they're sort of running out as we approach the break here. What do you sort of forecast for them moving forward? Right. I mean, we're almost halfway through the year, so certainly we're pretty far into it. I mean, everybody wants to be the 2019. Nats or the 2021 Braves were basically average teams halfway through the season and then turned it on and ended up winning the World Series. Those uh, examples are few and far between. I'll say this about the Mets. National League, a little bit easier, though it still looks like it's going to take, you know, upper 80 wins to get in. So they're going to have to hustle. It doesn't look like uh, they're going to be teams other than maybe the NL Central winner, which doesn't help them. Uh, who are going to be in an 85 win. So they're going to have to play much better to get in. Their hope is that if they get in, you know, Verlander and Scherzer can be themselves. They certainly are not going to have the number of innings that they normally have by the end. And, you know, if Verlander and Scherzer are even close to what they've done in the past, multiple Cy Young winners, uh, that's a formidable rotation in the playoffs. Now, that's a lot of ifs. And, uh, you know, obviously you placed your bet early on the match. You're probably not too happy with that, but... You know, I mean, I think the Mets are even more unhappy about it. Uh, they their their bet is three hundred seventy seven million plus one hundred eleven million in tax, so that's four hundred eighty eight million. I mean, I see Steve Cohn a lot around the ballpark, and he seems to be doing okay. At least he's not showing it. Uh, maybe behind the scenes it's different, but publicly he's been uh, he's been very good about it. But 
You know, unlike some of those people who bet, he, he can afford to lose $488 million. Well, Buck Showalter said, too, this week that he hasn't lost confidence in the group. Whether or not that's true inside the clubhouse, I guess we don't know. But as it relates to the Yankees, you mentioned Volpe struggling with his swing a little bit uh, so far in the year, although um, he was able to pick up his 10th home run, I think I saw a couple of days ago. But what do you make of his sort of early season offensive struggles? You mentioned the defense, which has been stellar. Um, how is he progressing, in your opinion, for a rookie that was so hyped? Well, I mean, there are a lot of good signs, but the one bad sign is he's still under 200. He's got company there with the Yankees as they have a few starting players under 200, and they're going to be patient with him. The fans have been patient, too. They're not booing him. They are booing Donaldson and Stanton. He's out there working hard, great kid, loves baseball. You know, he's doing his best. Uh, he has shown some surprising power with the 10 home runs, as you mentioned. He's got the 15 stolen bases. His defense has been solid. So, you know, they're saying that they're going to go with him. And, of course, they're going to say that until they don't. But, uh, you know, he's one of only a few players that has 10 home runs and 15 stolen bases. I know that's a trick stat. It may not mean that much because I, I do know, as you alluded to, scouts are worried about the fact that he looks like he has an uphill swing, an uppercut swing, and looks like he's – swing as hard as he can. And that isn't the player that they saw in high school that they fell in love with. And some of them are recommending that he ditch the launch angle. Now I talked to Anthony a couple of days ago and he's, he acted like he barely heard of the launch angle and he's not doing the launch angle, but the scouts are seeing something different. They're seeing the launch angle. They're seeing a guy who's not worried about strikeouts. And they say, this is different than the guy who was just a battler in high school and early in the minors, and a guy who was great with two strikes and, uh, you know, a guy that they loved as a player. And some of them think that he should go down to the minors and work on it. Uh, I don't foresee that happening anytime in the next few days anyway. Uh, the Yankees seem to be very much behind him, and he is doing the other things well. So um, we'll see if he comes around. Eventually, I think he's going to be a great player. Uh, you know, obviously showing the power is a huge plus, but – uh, I do kind of see what the scouts are saying. When you're batting under 200, it's probably hard to argue against that you the fact that their your swing probably does need an adjustment. Yeah, Yankees have said at least publicly that they're not going to send him down at right. least for now. But you know, I wonder if it's a little bit of a case too where you got this kid who was so hyped coming in wants to do so well, maybe gripping the wheel a little bit tighter than he should be. If it is a mechanical issue with the swing, and some scouts are recommending that he goes down to the minors to fix it, I mean, is that an easily solvable problem with with a trip down to the minors, or is it something a little bit more serious? You know, they think it's very solvable. I mean, they saw this kid in the minor, in, the, in the early minors and in high school, and uh, he was a great hitter with a level swing. And they liken it to uh, Dustin Pedroia, who came up with the Red Sox, a uh, smallish guy, smaller than Volpe, and. Um, you know, I guess had a little bit of an uppercut swing at the beginning, hit 191, which is a little bit under what Volpe's hitting right now, about, about the same, though, and uh, his first go-round. And then he went back and had an offseason and corrected it and came back an outstanding player, eventually won an MVP. Uh, so, you know, they, they believe in Volpe generally. I, I believe the Yankees, I do think, believe in him. Obviously, he did, does need to make some adjustment because, you know, you're not going to be a star if you're hitting under 200. Uh, you know, unless you're like a Joey Gale type and it's 40 home runs, that's not going to happen. But like I said, he is doing some things well. He is playing solid defense so they can live with it for now. But uh, I do kind of see what the scouts are saying with that uppercut swing. And um, they believe that it is fixable. It may take a little bit of time, but they believe that he can fix it. What's the latest on Aaron Judge's health and availability? Well, he's hoping by the end of the week that he's going to start taking some swings. So uh, how close that puts him, uh, we're still not quite sure. Uh, could he be within 10 days? Possibly. They really have never put a timetable on it. I think that's partly he doesn't really want to put the timetable out there. Uh, they, I'm sure they have some sort of idea. But when we ask him if he's going to definitely be back before the All-Star break, they, they can't even guarantee that. I do think it's a good sign that he's going to start taking some swings. He hopes on Sunday uh, and then get going. So if he starts taking swings on Sunday, it's possible, I guess, that he could be back within a week or 10 days after that. Obviously, he's been missed uh, immeasurably. Uh, uh, it's, I mean, 
bizarre how they've fallen down without uh, Judge. Um, obviously, Rizzo's hitting some bad luck, but Stanton, a very streaky guy, has not hit well. LeMahieu, we don't know what's happened to him. Donaldson down to 127. I mean, these are all great names. Two former MVPs in Stan and Donaldson, a two-time batting champion in LeMahieu. Rizzo, obviously, we know all he's done. And uh, I, I think Rizzo's actually shouldn't be included in that group. Everybody's including him. He's actually been pretty good. But the other three guys really need to get going without uh, without judging the lineup. And uh, they've relied on the pitching. And until uh, last night with Armand getting uh, blasted there, uh, the pitching, by and large, has been very, very good and has kept them uh, on the cusp of the race, at least. If if they can't self-solve these offensive struggles that they've had, and maybe it's as simple as Aaron Judge coming back and giving them that kind of momentum boost that they need, maybe not, with the other guys that you've mentioned that haven't been performing offensively. I mean, is this Yankees team one that should be players at the deadline? Do they need to switch things up a little bit? What do they need to do here? Well, their big hope is that Carlos Rodon will be back and be himself. He was throwing, he had 95 miles an hour at Somerset uh, and a rehab start a couple nights ago. And uh, he seems to be on the way back. He probably needs maybe one or two more rehab starts. But you combine uh, Rodon with Cole, that's a fantastic one-two punch. Certainly Cortez, we're not ruling him out at this, at this juncture, but he's out right now. If he comes back, that's another plus. I mean, uh, obviously, Severino hasn't been great to this point, but he does have some pedigree. I, I think their hope is that their their starting pitching could carry them through. Uh, their offense should be better. With the names that they have, they're not that old. We, we talked about the Mets. Uh, these guys aren't 40 or 38. Donaldson's still fielding the position well. Uh, it's a little bit shocking. And, uh, you know, obviously, they need Judge back. And once Judge comes back and Rodon back, uh, they have a very good team. Do they have the best team in baseball? I, I kind of doubt it based on what's gone on, but uh, they certainly should have a playoff team. And when you've got a combination of Cole and if Rodon is healthy, that's almost as good a one-two punch as anybody's got, and that's what they're going to rely on. I don't want to keep you too much longer, John, but I do want to ask you about what's going on with the A's uh, and this potential move to Vegas. What What is the latest that you're hearing about – how this could get done with an owner's vote and, and whether or not this is really a real, the reality that it looks like it is. Yeah. I mean, they, they say that certainly there's an ownership group led by Mark Ottenhaus, the other brewers owner who's going to take, they say a very serious look at this. Obviously the A's uh, publicly have been bashed uh, and probably to some degree, rightfully so. So it's been kind of negative uh, for baseball and, you know, me personally, I wonder if they deserve this great boost of moving to Las Vegas. And I, I do think it will be uh, good for the uh, pocketbook of the owner. Uh, do they deserve it the way they have behaved, the way they have uh, knocked down the budget? The payroll is uh, minuscule. Uh, the minor leaguers they've really spent less on. Um, you know, I, it looks like they're going to be rewarded. I mean, obviously, the owners are saying they're going to take a serious look at it. They've got a committee together. It's up to them. Uh, they can approve this move. And, um, you know, at this point, I would say that the odds are pretty good that they will be a approved for a move to Las Vegas, which, you know, probably will be a boon for the organization, which is a plus. Uh, you know, my one caveat on this is, uh, do, do these, does this ownership group deserve this? Because uh, that was a great spot for expansion. And we don't know when baseball is going to expand, the two obvious cities to expand to would have been Nashville and Las Vegas. Now they'll have to find a second city, whether that be Salt Lake, Portland, Orlando, whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, it seems like the A's uh, are likely to be approved for that. Nothing guaranteed as the owners are going to take a look at it. It's interesting what's going on in Las Vegas, uh, just in general, with the way that that sports landscape has changed dramatically with the Golden Knights coming in and now everything's sort of expanding. But you mentioned kind of being rewarded for bad behavior. Is there a danger that this would sort of set a precedent that you can strip the budget down and behave badly and ultimately make more money? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's possible, but... I, I, I've got to say, baseball doesn't move franchises very often. Obviously, we had the Montreal to Nats move, and it's been almost 20 years uh, to Washington move. Uh, baseball doesn't move franchises like the NFL does. 
So I, I think this is going to be the exception. I hope so. Uh, I, I don't think anybody's going to try to, uh, you know, ruin their franchise where they are now to uh, so that they can move somewhere else. Uh, you know, I, 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 I hope this is the one example of this and this will be the last one. But, uh, you know, I, I get it. If baseball approves it, I understand it. I do think Las Vegas has proven to be a great sports town. Obviously, the hockey's been an immense success, at least uh, in terms of fans. Uh, the Raiders have been a success there. And uh, it's probably um, difficult to turn this down at this point and make them stay in Oakland. I, I understand they have a, a very loyal and excellent fan base, but, uh, you know, it's hard to judge right now who's all at fault for this. I don't blame the fans. Is it, is it the city of Oakland? Is it the ownership? You know, obviously ownership has not behaved great, so it's we, you tend not to side with them. But uh, at this point, it's kind of become untenable in Oakland. I know they got 27,000 fans there for their protest or whatever, but that, that's a one-day thing. So, you know, I, the fans are great. They don't deserve this. The ownership is not great. They probably don't deserve this either. But, uh, you know, this is probably the only result that's possible at this point. It's not always fair, unfortunately, especially no. with the amount of money that we're talking about. Just a quick quick question to you, and then, and then I'll get you out of here. So we're about six weeks from the trade deadline. Do you see any any big-name players that we should be keeping our eye on that could be on the move? Well, I, we don't certainly think Otani is going to be on the move because the Angels are in the race. So that's the big one. Uh, I would say that's a, an incredible long shot at this point. Um, you know, I think it's up to the central. If anybody takes hold in the central, we might have a few sellers out of there and we'll have some very good players who could be on the move. No Otani type, but who is? Uh, you certainly, I think Milwaukee and Minnesota are in, in to stay. Uh, we'll see. I, probably Cincinnati is to the way they're playing now, but uh, some of the other teams, uh, Cleveland could be a seller potentially. They're clearly in the race right now, but they have uh, Shane Bieber and some others. Uh, the Cubs uh, in the race right now, if they fall back, uh, Marcus Stroman, uh, Cody Bellinger, they've got some players who could be traded. And I, I think the big one could be the White Sox because they do not look like a contender right now. I think they need to give it some time and see what shapes up there. But you know, they've liked this nucleus, but it's underperformed. Now, this is the second year in a row they've really underperformed with what we think is a talented group. Uh, you know, they, they certainly will trade if they're not in the race. Uh, Giolito is a very nice player and some others, Tim Anderson. Uh, but, you know, maybe they'll just go for a complete restart. And they've got some two big stars who potentially could be dealt. And that's Luis uh, Robert, the center fielder. And Dylan Cease, the starting pitcher. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't count that out completely. So, uh, we could have a pretty good deadline if that occurs. Uh, no Otani, though. So, I know that's what everyone's looking for. Uh, he's going to be an angel, I'm sure. <laughs> it's be a fascinating few weeks as we hit the halfway point in the season. John Hammond, appreciate the insight. All right. Thanks, Carolyn.